Hello, good morning. My name is Joel Bedger, and uh, I'm an instructor of music here at Bethel College and the Logistical Director of Convocation. I'd like to welcome you to this special convocation in Memorial Hall. Many of you have traveled long distances to be here to attend this conference, and I would like to personally thank you for your presence here at Bethel College and for being part of our community this weekend. We want to thank all of you for being here this morning, and we welcome you. It is my privilege today to introduce Dr. Mark Jansen. Mark Jansen is a professor of history at Bethel College. As a native of Nebraska and a Bethel College graduate, Mark has lived and worked extensively in Europe. From 1988 to 91, he studied theology at Humboldt University in East Berlin as part of Mennonite Central Committee's East Europe Study and Service Program. From 1993 to 1996, he worked at resource development for Bread of Life in Belgrade, Serbia, and as regional coordinator for Mennonite Central Committee. He is the author of several books, including Mennonite German Soldiers, Nation, Religion, and Family in the Prussian East, and The Wrong Side of the Wall, an American in East Berlin during the Peaceful Revolution. He is co-editor with John Thiessen of two translations, The Military Service Exemption of Mennonites of Provincial Prussia and The Danzig Mennonite Church, Its Origins and History from 1569 to 1919. He currently serves as the North American representative on the editorial council of volume five of Mennonite's Lexicon. Please help me welcome Dr. Mark Jansen to the podium. Convocation presentation is also serving as the keynote address for the Mennonites and the Holocaust Conference being held at Bethel today and tomorrow. We welcome especially students and community guests who are not otherwise attending the conference to this public session. Our keynote speaker is Doris Bergen, who is the Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Toronto. Her talk is entitled Neighbors killers, enablers, and witnesses, the many roles of Mennonites in the Holocaust. She has published in the areas of German Protestant support for the Nazis, military chaplains in the German army, and on the role of ethnic Germans in the Holocaust, among other areas. She's also the author of War and Genocide, a Concise History of the Holocaust, a widely used textbook, including in the history of the Holocaust, Course, Holocaust course I am teaching this semester. So among the many other things going on at this conference, my students are getting to hear from and meet the author of their textbook. I first met Doris two weeks before our oldest child was born, which makes it super easy for me to remember how long ago that was. It will be 22 years in August. We were both new to the University of Notre Dame, I as a PhD student, and she is a professor coming from the University of Vermont. She became my doctoral advisor, or Doktomutter, as the Germans would say. Her guidance was instrumental to my success, steering me through coursework, building a dissertation committee, and the dissertation defense. She pointed me toward multiple grants and saw to it that departmental money came my way. She took me along to conferences and introduced me generously to her colleagues and friends. She got to know and became a friend of our family as well. We've caught up with each other over the years in various venues, and she has spoken before at Bethel in convocation, we think about 15 years ago. She is one of the very first people I called as planning on this conference began, and she was offered assistance at every turn. Now she's here in person, once again, helping a student and a colleague, as is so typical of her. I am delighted be back in your classroom. And so pleased to introduce you to this community. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bergen to the podium. Thank you so much, Mark, for the generous introduction. And I have to say, I've had 10 PhDs 
supervised to completion, Mark Jansen was the very first, and I'm so proud of all he's achieved. I also want to thank uh, John Tyson and John Sharp for organizing this remarkable conference, our hosts here at Bethel College, those people who participated in our conference on Mennonites and the Holocaust in Toronto in June, and I want to say a special word of thanks to the late Gerhard Rempel, whose manuscript dealing with many of the themes of this conference and in my talk has been so influential for me, and also to his daughter, Lisa Rempelhoy, who's here at the conference. And finally, a word of thanks to all the conference participants. I enjoyed the session this morning very much and look forward to the rest. I'm going to begin my talk with an apology, then a spoiler, and then a contradiction. The apology, sorry, I'm Canadian, I have to do it, is about the title. The title is good, but it doesn't quite fit, and I'm going to add a few words to the end to make it more accurate. In addition to neighbors, killers, enablers, witnesses, the many roles of Mennonites in the Holocaust, I want to add, and the challenges of studying them. So that's the focus. The spoiler is in case I run out of time, it happens, I'm going to tell you now how the talk is going to end. It won't be a big surprise. I'm going to end by calling for more scholarship. All of you students out there, you ever have that happen? You're writing your paper, you're like, how do I end my paper? More research. More analysis is needed. There are still more questions. That's how we're going to end as well. And finally, the contradiction. My talk is about scholarship, but I want to start by telling you something personal. I grew up in a Mennonite family, though not in a Mennonite community. And to be honest, I was never interested in Mennonite history. In fact, I actively avoided the subject, but the topic found me. Through the projects that I worked on, pro-Nazi uh, German Christian group, German military chaplains, the Volksdeutschen ethnic Germans in Eastern Europe, in every one of these projects, Mennonites popped out of the archives at me, literally. And I want to just tell you about the first encounter because it's quite relevant to our talk. It happened while I was still a PhD student without a dissertation topic. My, my PhD advisor, Gerhard Weinberg, assigned us the task of reviewing microfilm collections. Remember microfilm? that were related to our projects. I was reading a set of Gestapo files in the microfilm collection of the Hoover Institution when I came across a folder titled Prohibitions on Public Speaking, Rede Verbote. So I thought this could be interesting. Inside were a list of individuals who had been prohibited from speaking in Nazi Germany in the summer of 1939. Leafing through that list, many of them accused of giving sermons that were pro-Jewish, that were critical of Hitler, I found the name Johannes Martens, Einlage. Of course, my mother's name was Martens. My entire relatives came from Einlage in the Kortitsa colony in Ukraine, and I thought, Johannes Martins, an anti-Nazi resistor, my relative, right here in the archive. I was so excited. I kept reading and I discovered the reason Johannes Martins from Einlage was prohibited from public speaking in Germany in 1939 is because he had been on a tour promoting anti-communism, speaking in favor of the National Socialist regime, its anti-Jewish policies, and describing the suffering of Mennonites in the Soviet Union. Lo and behold, August 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Hitler-Stalin Pact, suddenly, anti-communism was out. 
Johannes Martens found himself threatened with police, um, what's the word, like, with arrest, if he continued his speaking tour. Suddenly, from a resistor, my potential relative turned into a kind of enabler, facilitator, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He would have to wait two more years to start up that speaking tour again in 1941. When I saw that piece, I wrote immediately to my Oma, born in 1902 in Anlage, and said, is this our relative? She wrote me back and said, it's from another Martins family in the same town. Years later, preparing this talk, I thought about that event, which I dismissed at the time, and I realized there are four insights I can draw from it that I want to share with you um, to frame this event. The first is, thinking of our title, that the same person and even the same actions in the volatile circumstances of the Holocaust and World War II could fit very different roles. So you look at that title, enablers, neighbors, killers, witnesses, they're not mutually exclusive. The second thing, maybe easily forgotten, that struck me is Contrary maybe to a comforting narrative that's not specific to Mennonites, it was not anti-communism that was the constant in thinking among Mennonites, ethnic Germans, also many Christians across the 1930s and 40s, it was anti-Semitism. Anti-communism could be suspended for two years and was among many very vehement anti-communists. Where were they in 1939, 1940, and the first half of 1941? The third insight is that even, or maybe especially, accounts and sources you get from your relatives need to be given a critical reading. Why did I just believe my Oma? Not that she would ever not tell me the truth but never occurred to me that the guy maybe was not from a different Martins family. And finally, the fourth insight, there are pluses and minuses to having a personal connection to the topic you study. Of course, at the time I encountered Johannes Martins in the archive, I didn't know what I learned later, that some Mennonites from those same communities in Ukraine included killers like Heinrich Wintz, who headed the Einsatzkommando that killed thousands of Jews in the Crimea, that there were Mennonites in the SS, in cavalry units that were so destructive in Belarusia. There were Mennonites present at the mass killings of Jews in Lvov, in Kiev, in Saparazhia, certainly as witnesses, often as beneficiaries, frequently as collaborators, and in some cases, certainly as perpetrators. Much of this I learned in detail only in 2006 when I read the late Gerhard Rempel's manuscript and realized how high the stakes were and are in this topic, Mennonites and the Holocaust. So I want to explore what I've identified as five challenges, some of them have already been maybe you've been alerted to with this topic, and some responses to them. And I want to add one more warning, not an apology. These challenges and the responses, they have a kind of dialectical relationship. So you're going to find, just when you might think we're solving one problem, another one is going to be revealed. So be ready for it. It's like those nesting dolls. The first challenge is about insiders and outsiders. John Tyson already pointed to this. The topic of Mennonites in the Holocaust is quite bifurcated. Of course, there's an enormous amount of work by what you might call insiders. Some of it scholarly, much of it memoir or personal accounts. There are advantages to work by insiders, perhaps the biggest one being they actually are interested and care about the topic. I remember going to a conference in the early 1990s, shortly after archives in the former East Bloc were opened, and seeing a Polish scholar 
give an amazing presentation about the demographics of the guards at Auschwitz. He had a huge spreadsheet where he listed the year they were born, their occupation, and so on. And one small column included their religion. In and amongst the many Roman Catholics and Lutherans, Greek Catholics, Orthodox, there was listed one Mennonite. I doubt if anyone else but me remembers that one Mennonite on the list. That's the advantage of being the insider. You notice and you care. There are other advantages, of course, access to certain kinds of sources. For a project on the Volksdeutschen, I interviewed a number of my relatives and their relatives' relatives, um, and they told me some very interesting things. Things about relative, for example, one cousin named Isaac Isaac, who became the SS man Albert, about recriminations within the family, about decisions made um, that had terrible consequences. They might not have told those things to anyone else, but more important, no one else would have come across these people. They're not the kind of people who are encountering historians and professors of historians on a daily basis. And from those interviews, I gained a really important insight, it's also relevant to our topic, which is about the centrality of family networks in determining behaviors, decisions, and also memories and narratives of events after the fact. But of course, insiders also face disadvantages. Most strongly, the push and pull of mythologies, and in particular, the myth of Mennonite innocence. I think it can very easily pull scholars to either defend or attack, and also to censor themselves. Even after this keynote was announced, I received emails from very upset people, worried that their relatives would somehow be um, dishonored, um, in my talk or at the conference, people get worked up about these things. And it's not surprising. You want to discover that your father, your uncle, your grandfather was a mass murderer? That your mother, your aunt, your grandmother covered for them? There's more I could say about that, but that's another account. Now for outsiders, of course, the biggest challenge is why bother? Why bother about excuse me, <coughs> Mennonites, a small group. And writing from the outside, of course, you make yourself vulnerable to attack, but also to the condescension of people saying, you don't really get it. You don't really know. Nevertheless, there is a small and slowly growing scholarship by outsiders that doesn't focus on Mennonites, but integrates them in extremely valuable ways. I would mention Wendy Lauer, even though they don't make it to the index, Carol Burkhoff, Andrzej Angrich, Eric Steinhardt, whose article about the chameleon Jack Reimer, I know some students here, have read. In terms of responding to this insider-outsider challenge, my answer, I guess, is pretty straightforward. For the insiders, I think we can be inspired by the words of Saul Friedlander, one of the greatest scholars of the Holocaust, himself a Jewish survivor, who writes movingly about the possibility of every scholar mustering the discipline, the discipline to balance their own subject position with the genuine attempt at inquiry. There's a reason our academic disciplines are called disciplines. They mean you can't just make it up. So the discipline, very important. As for outsiders, I think it's the job of the insiders to show them that the topic of Mennonites and the Holocaust is interesting, significant, and important. And I do think people have done a really good job of this. People in this room, Aileen Friesen, Ben Goosen, Steve Schroeder, Mark Jansen, and many, John Thiessen, and many others. So now the second challenge, they get harder. The second challenge was already mentioned by John Thiessen, 
This is the challenge of definitions. So what are we even talking about? What are we even talking about? What's a Mennonite? You're going to see in this conference, we're talking about people in Germany, in the Soviet Union, in North America, in South America, in the Netherlands. We're talking about Mennonites as a religious group, as an ethnic group. Do we define Mennonites as who is baptized? Does that mean children can't be Mennonites? Or do we talk about who was a good or proper Mennonite? Of course, that definition becomes completely subjective. I'm not going to resolve this definition, though I have issue, but I want to offer two guidelines as we think about the challenge of defining what we're talking about. The first is to beware the temptation to define to distraction. George Orwell has said, we should let the meaning choose the word and not the other way around. If we want language to express rather than suppress meaning. And what he means by that is if you get so caught up in the definition, you end up dodging the issues at hand. I can give you three examples where I think this happens all the time. You ever gone to a conference or heard a paper on genocide? where all people talk about is, well, is it genocide or not? Does it fit the definition? What's the definition? Gone is the issue at stake. Or how about racism? You ever listen to people parse the term racism? By the time they finish, well, it's not really racism, maybe it's a no intention. The actual issue has been forgotten. And of course, the third example is anti-Semitism. So that's my first thing. Definitions are important. But it's really important that they not become the focus of attention because that easily becomes an excuse not to talk about the thing itself. My second issue on defining Mennonites, I do think it's very important to have a functional definition. By that I mean, again, as a, speaking as a historian, not a definition based on individual identities, which are very, very fluid and change repeatedly, and by the way, if you ever want something good to read about the slippery term identity, look for the old article by Rogers Brubaker and Frederick Cooper. A functional definition that takes into account communal bonds, not just individual identity, the ways in which Mennonite is both constructed, but also quite concrete and even legal at times, the way in which the category could be imposed, but also instrumentalized and harnessed, and also, very importantly, the way in which the category includes people of both genders and all ages. And I want to just emphasize here, it's going to come up again, the absolute importance of keeping women in our view over the course of this discussion. I know Marlene Epp and others have done very important work on women Mennonites, also during the Holocaust period. But precisely when it comes to definition, the work of maintaining narrating and performing Mennonitism has largely been the work of women. And here I'll just point to Hans Werner's uh, wonderful book, and he's mentioned about his mother and the work of memory as salvation. We'll come back to that later. So broad definition, functional definition, and don't obsess. What about the Holocaust? This term is also hard to define. I'm going to define Holocaust broadly as well. First of all, I think a chronological range is really important, absolutely crucial to include the phase of persecution, the pre-war years, and also the immediate post-war period in order to understand the dynamics of the Holocaust. But I also want to define the Holocaust not in terms of its victims, but its perpetrators. And by this I mean, I'm going to use as my definition, the Holocaust was the Nazi German state-sponsored programs of persecution and killing that had as the central target Jews, but that included other groups as well. And the targeting of those groups is interrelated. Let me explain what I mean. This is particularly important for Mennonites. Of course, the first group of people killed in Nazi Germany, systematically, 
were not Jews, but people with disabilities. That was the first active program of killing, beginning even before the invasion of Poland. And we also know that Roma, Soviet prisoners of war, Polish civilians were killed in the hundreds of thousands and in some cases millions, Soviet prisoners of war. And that murder of Jews was often intertwined in the same spaces with killing of those other groups. We also know that the perpetrators of those interconnected acts of murder were the same people. This is why it's really important to define the genocide in terms of the perpetrators, not the victims. Why is this relevant to Mennonites? Because high concentrations of Mennonite populations, in southern Ukraine is our clearest example, of course were sites of extreme violence against several of these groups. It was one of the regions with the highest killing rate of Jews, precisely there where Mennonites were concentrated. It was also a region of mass killing of Soviet prisoners of war, some of whom were also Jews, some of whom, of course, were also Mennonites, and of mass open killing of Roma and partisans. These processes were involved, and they were also contagious. And to illustrate how that contagion was perceived and represented, I'm going to read you just a short excerpt from the memoir of the Mennonite novelist Hans Harder, as quoted in Gerhard Rempel. He's talking about 1941. It's very brief. One morning in September, Harder wrote, as they drove south of Kiev over muddy roads, their vehicle began to jump, he was riding with several soldiers, as if they had hit a roadway paved with logs underneath all the muck. The bucking of the vehicle became rapidly more intense. It threw us around the cab and made us quite bewildered. The driver stopped. We looked for the cause of our discomfort below the vehicle and recognized corpse after corpse, prisoners of war. Someone tried to explain the hell in the mud, as our driver called it. Prisoners of war, without question. But what kind of people could these have been, who had been buried in the morass and driven deeper into the ground by our vehicle? A couple of times, we remembered, a head had been seen in the sludge. Jews? Armenians? Or some other type of Oriental? You think about that description. It's so bizarre, the nightmare quality, driving over those bodies, the sense of who could they be, and the blurring together of the categories, Soviet prisoners of war, Jews, and then out of the blue, Armenians, victims of a genocide in the previous world war. So this contagion of violence, extremely important to note the slippage between categories of victims. Of course, most famously with that label, Jewish Bolshevik, you could invoke one without mentioning the other, but also in the interconnections of other groups. It's also important to mention that residing in that area of extreme carnage, Mennonites played crucial roles in a number of ways in identifying Jews to the Germans with many such accounts, but also, when you think about it, in abandoning other Soviet POWs to their fate. Right? We all know the many accounts of those Mennonites who served in German uniform Many of them were recruited from out of the ranks of Red Army prisoners of war. So the kind of maybe shame or sense of betrayal that in some indirect way is expressed in Hans Harder's account, I think is linked to that proximity with numerous victim groups. Let's turn to our third challenge, even harder, the challenge of anti-Semitism. Now, I just told you, we need to think about Jews and non-Jews as victims of Nazi genocide, but I do believe it's also crucial to maintain a clear focus on the way that Jews occupied a particular place, both in Nazi destruction and, in our topic, Mennonites and the Holocaust. In fact, I think it would be fair to say 
we need to analyze the ways in which Jews, and even more strongly, anti-Semitism, is built into familiar Mennonite narratives. Growing up, I often heard that Mennonites are like Jews. And in fact, I often heard Mennonites described as Jews, as the frequently victimized people, persecuted people, homeless in the world, chosen in a special way by God. It took me many years working in the field I work in to recognize this trope as a form of inversion or appropriation, very common actually in other genocides I've studied, where people take on the identity of the victims as a way of erasing their own recognition of involvement on the side of victimizer. If we, Mennonites, are the Jews, well then, who are the Jews? This is very clear in Mennonite narratives too, where the Jews, particularly in accounts dealing with the 1920s and 30s in the Soviet Union, become narrated as the villains. How many accounts have you read where the NKVD or KGB agent, the interrogator, the head of the collective farm, fill in the blank, is described as a Jew? Every narrative. And in fact, I started to think those descriptions are so frequent that after a while, you don't need to use the word Jew to invoke the description. It's like that song we used to sing as a kid, I don't know if you all know that, there was a man who had a dog and bingo was his name and then you clap and leave out a letter. Pretty soon you don't have to say any of the letters and everyone knows you're spelling out bingo. This is how these narratives uh, work. And I'm just going to give you one example, a fairly early narrative, because I think it kind of sets the trope. So this is from a book by Gerhard Kenner. I'm going to translate from German. It's called Mennonites Serving in the Red Army. I'm just going to read you a short passage where he describes political training as a member of the Red Army. The politruk Nemshenko, a small, skinny, curly-haired Jewish man, gave our commando lessons in political views five times in the week, five times each week. The politruk Nemshenko was a genuine, fanatical, godless communist. He was energetically engaged in trying to train us crowds to give up our belief in God and Christ. Repeatedly, he told us that Christian faith in God and Christian religion was nothing other than opium and an idiocy for the people. Politruk Nemchenko called us Mennonites mostly crowds because he couldn't pronounce the word Mennonite properly in Russian. Of course, this brainwashing had no influence on us whatsoever. And it was thanks to God's grace that the Jewish Itsky did not succeed in winning a single Mennonite comrade over to his communist, Marxist, Leninist teachings. This account is from 1975, maybe more crude in its language but quite typical of many others that we read. And again, the linkage between these accounts of Jewish Bolsheviks and discussion of the destruction of Jews under the Nazis occurs in many, many different sources. The solution to this challenge, I think, is first of all, we need more literary scholars helping us analyze these texts using the tools of literary analysis, not simply reading all these texts at face value, but really analyzing and juxtaposing them. And above all, we need multiple sources, so that we're not simply writing the history of Mennonites and the Holocaust from Mennonite sources or from German sources, but that we're integrating sources from Jews, from Roma, from Russians, from Ukrainians, and from many others. Only in this way, I think, can we make visible the underlying structures of anti-Semitic narratives that shape these self-understandings. And finally, I think it's important to note that anti-Semitism 
the way it functions in these narratives is not an emotion, which is what we tend to look for, like hatred. It's not that. It's a habit. It's a pattern. It's a set of structures that you don't even have to think about to utilize. I'm going to do my last two challenges very quickly because they're short. The fourth challenge, you can probably guess it yourself, is how do we avoid writing scholarship that is moralistic or judgmental? I bet you were thinking that, right? Mm. What makes you think you would do any better? Which scholar hasn't been asked that? What makes you think you would be any better? I want to say something radical. I don't think doing scholarship on the past in any way implies that I think I would do better. I think that's a total dodge. I think the job of the scholar is not to make a moral judgment. Maybe the moral judgment is the starting point. It's the reason we even engage in the scholarship. Scholarship itself is about analyzing and understanding how could these things happen? How could human communities, people, like us, people who might even be our relatives, behave or act in certain ways. That's not a judgment, that's analysis. And I think the sort of high ground of avoiding judgment becomes a very easy way to avoid discussion. It's important to try to break apart those myths, partly because maintaining myths take an enormous amount of effort, intellectual effort, social effort, you have to police all those people who step out of line, but also spiritual effort. Maintaining a myth of innocence means harnessing religious beliefs to the task of legitimating the past. Is that what religion is for? I don't think it should be. So how do we avoid that judgmental position? I think one way is to use the tools of genocide scholarship which above all involve comparison, comparison. Some of you know, may, may know the work of Lian Fuji, my colleague who died very recently, just last week, who worked on Rwanda and was finishing a project on lynching. She analyzed in particular the importance of friendship networks in determining the roles that people play in situations of extreme violence, an extremely relevant topic that can be carried over into any case of genocide. Mennonites, in other words, were not unique, though they were distinctive. Many of the issues that we explore, including the issue of breaking the myth of one's own innocence or purity, have been and are being confronted and dealt with by many other people. Italians, Poles, Catholics, members of the Red Cross, and these comparisons can be both humbling, which is always good, and extremely liberating. So now I'm going to turn to the last uh, challenge. It's obvious. Haven't I just laid out an enormous and impossible task? This is the biggest challenge. So I'm saying we need scholarship that will contextualize the topic of Mennonites in the Holocaust, that will be disciplined by our academic disciplines and the conventions and rules that they involve, that will look for and be attentive to the unknown unknowns, that will have breadth, use a variety of sources, engage all of the relevant languages, make comparisons, use the tools of literary and social science analysis. This is impossible, right? Well, of course, it's not impossible if many people are involved. There's so much that we still don't know about Mennonites in the Holocaust. I started making just a tiny list. I would love to know more about Stutthof, the concentration camp there in the middle of a Mennonite community, about interactions with Mennonites in Roma, especially in Ukraine, about intermarriage, Mennonites and others. There's always a few glimpses. About Mennonite relations with Jews in the pre-war period. Why one of my interviewees referred to Jew days where they used to go to the nearby Jewish settlement and just beat people up for sport. Was that common? About the role of singing and music comes up over and over again. Like some Mennonites I encountered in one source who other ethnic Germans thought they were gypsies because their clothes were dirty. They said, but we began singing a hymn in harmony and they immediately knew these are no Roma. 
about the methods of disciplining people who step out of line for a communal narrative. These are just some of the many outstanding questions. We need a lot of people to do this scholarship. We need insiders and outsiders, multiple perspectives and many skills. It's why this conference is so valuable and I can't wait to hear the rest of the presentations. classroom and class gets out in about six, seven minutes. And so for the rest of the class period, uh, we have time for questions. And because we're in a classroom, we're going to privilege the students. So students who have, student, Bethel students or students who've come uh, as part of the conference from Mennonite Church USA or Mennonite Canada, uh, colleges and universities. If the students would come to the mics on either side uh, and ask your questions there, please. So questions from students. Hello, thank you for speaking. Um, I'm one of the students in Mark's History of the Holocaust course, and so we, I read your book, um, and so I apologize to those of you who haven't read her book. Go ahead and do that, it's awesome. Um, and I learned a lot. But I was wondering if you could answer to, um, in chapter four, uh, Specific, I know. Um, you, uh, you speak on the euthanasia programs, um, and I was wondering what um, perception and reaction to the euthanasia programs of newborns um, and disabled people um, were within a Mennonite context and then in a general context. Responses to It is such a great question, I'm so glad you asked it, because I think the murder of the disabled gets left out all the time in discussions of the Holocaust, all the time, and it's unbelievably important. So let me start with the general one first, because I have, no, I'll start with the Mennonites first, because I can answer that really briefly. I don't know, I haven't found anything. And, you know, I need to look more about that, because I know that inside Germany, the murder of disabled people was so relevant to the churches because many of the institutions that housed people with disabilities and even where killing occurred were run by the established churches. But I don't know yet, I don't know enough about Mennonite charitable institutions inside Germany and I haven't seen anyone do that work. So this is a really great topic for someone, I don't know, but it's not me. Secondly, I also think there's going to be a Mennonite connection in the occupied regions because the Germans didn't systematically kill disabled Poles or disabled Russians, but they pragmatically killed institutionalized people when they needed their buildings. So that, for example, we know this happened in Poland. The Germans would come into a town, they needed a nice big building for a headquarters for SS or whoever, and maybe a nice big building happened to be a mental hospital. Well, what did they want to keep those patients for? They just took them out and killed them, shot them, sometimes killed them in a gas van, and took over their building. So there must have been, in some of those cases, certainly Mennonite observers and so on. I haven't found them, but one asks those questions. The general response of the population, we do know that um, people did protest killing of the disabled and particularly as they discovered if it affected their own families. And we know that there were the sermons from Bishop von Galen, and they were widely circulated, and that there was a kind of shame that many, let's say, abled um, Germans of all kinds felt about these procedures. But in particular, I think what made that situation different was that it was in Galen's sermons too, the recognition that anyone could become a life unworthy of living. One of the most powerful parts of von Galen's sermons is when he says, what about the German soldier who comes back from fighting at the front to discover that his elderly father has been murdered because he's deemed no longer useful? 
So I think the disabled was really interesting. On the one hand, that was the most vulnerable category. That's why the killing began with them. On the other hand, it was a category in which everyone could understand one day I could be in that category. So I think that's why the opposition could build in a way that, say, with the killing of Jews or Roma, it did not. Hi there. Uh, thank you for coming. I just wanted to ask about, in your research, how much did you run into um, people removing themselves from situations, giving accounts and then saying, I didn't participate, but I saw someone else participate? This, again, what do you, you have really good students. It's a very, very perceptive <laughs> question. Yeah. It's a very perceptive question because I would say constantly, constantly. And you know how I said, like, women and women's accounts are so important for narrating Mennonite um, sort of self-perception? If you look at the huge pile of memoirs and accounts from the World War II period, a lot of them are written by women. Really, there's a very, very many women's accounts. And the women's accounts often describe, in a more direct way, Nazi crimes, you know? And even when the men describe them, they put it in the mouths of women. So one passage, I didn't read you, but I'm really glad you mentioned it, is from this book by uh, Hans Hildebrand, where he talks about, you know, we, in Ukraine, Mennonites of Ukraine, we were doing a lot better under the Germans. But he said, some people, especially the women, they suffered because of the German treatment of Jews. And he said, my great aunt, she saw with her own eyes how 50 Jews were killed, you know, right there, and she never recovered. Her frail, tender, you know, body could not deal with that truth. And so like this way of kind of admitting by using the words or putting them in the mouth of someone else, it is extremely, extremely common. And it's also why I think we need a literary reading and analysis of many of these accounts because they often reveal a lot through those cracks of someone told me this, someone else heard that, rather than saying, I saw this, which raises the question, well, what were you doing here? Much easier to say, you know, or I'm suffering because I've repressed this trauma or responsibility. My tante, she was frail. So yeah, very common. Okay, we're out of time. For conference participants, we'll be back in Clearwater Court at 1.30. Thank you, George.